Hello, welcome to my presentation on My Other Mother, My Other Self, which is the graphic novel I began about two years before I came to Falmouth in 2013 to do my MA in authorial illustration. It's a graphic novel and it's about a transformative period in my life when I decided to trace my birth mother. She gave me up for adoption when I was six days old and I first made contact with her about 30 years later. I think I was just 31. And this is the opening page. It says, I want to drag this story up to the surface. My birth mother needs, has always needed to keep it underground. She says, why go digging up the past? Better to put it in a box and try to forget about it. The book's also about my journey into the underworld of my unexplored and disowned emotions. Um, this, this is here from a dream. It's an image I made while I was at Falmouth on the MA. It didn't end up in the graphic novel, but it was part of this exploration of dreams and um, strange thoughts and feelings <laughs> that I wanted to explore. The book, it's about, it's a very emotional book. It's about abandonment, loss, longing, rage and grief. But it's also about love, healing, hope, passion and rebirth. This image I actually got from uh, turning around, a, it's, it's a sort of reverse image of an image I had in a dream at the early part of my journey, which I'll talk about. So you'll have gathered that finding my birth mother was quite an intense experience and it forced me to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of growing up. Um, I really needed to learn how to get support and how to you know, care for myself with some pretty overwhelming feelings that began to surface. Um, and this was pretty hard for a personality like mine that had relied mainly on repression and denial as coping mechanisms. So I got into meditation at the time the novel begins, and this is me on my first five-day silent retreat. You can see here the timing, it says 9.30, 9.32, 9.35. So yeah, I didn't manage to be quite as neat and polite in dealing with my stuff as I had hoped. Um, my partner and I, my partner at the time, also explored relationship counselling, which didn't go so well. Um, but then I decided to visit a Jungian therapist on my own who encouraged me to write and paint images from my dreams and my inner life. And that was quite a thing for me. I'd been an art teacher for about a decade, but I hadn't made any personal work for a really long time. Um, I remember my boss at the school I worked in saying that when you're working with A-level students, it's a bit like trying to reach into their soul and help them pull out what's there. And I remember feeling sad that I didn't really feel able to do that for myself. That somehow the heart of my practice had got lost, um, really, since college. So, yeah, I don't have any dream journals from that time to show you, but many of the images did filter through into my graphic novel. This image here, I dreamt about a baby that was almost dead, with this kind of very weak, waxy kind of woman, also almost dead, trying to emerge. And... Uh, I, I mentioned earlier how I reversed the image and I had this very kind of live, um, red, raging woman emerging later. Uh, another dream here, I'll, I'll let you interpret it however you like. Um, so yeah, when did I start writing the book? I think it must have been a few months after my birth mother withdrew contact from me back in 2009. So we met up monthly in secret for about seven months. Um, she hadn't felt able to tell her husband about me, and still hasn't. Um, there are, you know, understandable reasons for that. And she was going through a lot at the time. She was also having chemotherapy for breast cancer. She just had a mastectomy. So she was finding my neediness and my huge expectations overwhelming and hard to handle. And so was I. Um, this image here is a, a sort of surreal conversation I had with her at the wedding of my partner's mother to her new boyfriend. Um, I wouldn't have picked up a call at a family wedding except that she was proving so difficult to get hold of and she was obviously avoiding my calls a lot of the time. Um, I'm talking here in blue and she's in red and she's basically telling me she doesn't want to see me anymore because my my huge expectations were, were too much. 
Um, so from this point onwards, we've had telephone contact. It's still the case now. But we haven't seen each other, apart from twice, more recently twice. Um, but it, it's a very different relationship now. There's some very strong boundaries on both sides. And I'm still not known to her family, so I'm, I'm very much a secret. And that's how she wants to keep it, which is disappointing to me. Um, so, yeah, here I'm kind of morphing from a, a little baby into this kind of over-demanding, enraged beast that she, she can't handle. And so why did I start writing this book? Really because things didn't work out the way I hoped with my birth mother. I needed a way to deal with that frustration and disappointment and, and this feeling of like there was so much I needed to communicate and explore, which I'd kind of hoped to explore with her because it, it had been brought up by the reunion with her. So this galvanised me into writing and painting my version of our story. Um, the first version was just scribbled in pen into an A5 sketchbook, which is here. Um, I addressed it to her, my birth mother, as a, a letter. Um, but I never showed it to her, but it, it formed the seed of the graphic novel that I have now made. So yeah, with hindsight, I'd say I needed to take control of the story of what happened between us. And I needed to make some meaning out of all the, the suffering and the joy and the loss that I'd experienced. So I worked in pen and charcoal and different media for a couple of years. Um, during that time, I, I left my job and went to work at Gaia House, the meditation centre, as a gardener. Um, so, yeah, leaving my head of art teaching job, my home, my partner, my cats, um, was all part of the effect that meeting my birth mother and diving into my unconscious had on my external life at the time. Um, yeah, these two things happen simultaneously, um, the therapy and meditation, self-exploration and the meeting my birth mother. And there was a lot to process, so I had, to, I had a lot to think about and process and feel and um, express over the next few years. Still still am, really. Um, this is thanks to Steve Brown, who used to be head of the MA. He suggested I work in colour. I'd been thinking I should work in black and white as it would be more commercially uh, viable for publishing a graphic novel. Um, but he, he said, oh, but you obviously love colour. And I'm grateful to him because colour has been such a central thing. And it, I do, I really love it. So yeah, watercolour, it's wonderful. It requires this delicate balancing act between careful control and loose letting be. It's fluid, flowing, alive, glowing. And I like the way it's capable of multi-layered meanings it can be um very sort of transparent you can layer it up it can look like one thing but also like another it can be something that suggests many meanings and that that feels very apt for the sort of story that i'm wanting to tell i say here it's numinous with inner light but it's capric capricious uncontrollable mercurial unpossessable unpredictable ever shifting and I think that these words do actually sum up something of the quality of my earliest experience of love. I feel like my birth mother really loved me and it was a really radiant experience, but at the same time, yeah, it was confusing and she wasn't there and I lost her and um, the messages were very mixed and layered. So yeah, watercolour is the ideal me medium to describe the poignant, painful and deep vivid and sweet, yet uncertain, insecure and ephemeral nature of the connection with my mother that I had as a baby and also later relived with her as an adult. So yeah, I've been influenced by a lot of different people. Um, Marion Woodman, who explores the feminine psyche from a Jungian perspective. Um, people like James Hillman and my wonderful Buddhist teacher, Rob Babea, who was a bit of a, a radical maverick in the Buddhist world. Um, he... It was he was exploring this thing called a soul making dharma, um, a sort of soul make, a path of soul making. He was a jazz musician before he was a meditation teacher, and he, he was sort of the improvisational creative um, pioneer within the meditation world that I was and and still am involved in. Um, Nancy Friday, my other sorry, Nancy Friday, my mother, myself. That gave me the idea for my my title, my other mother, my other self. Most, most of us have to make sense of our relationship with our mother. And if we're women, then there's this thing that, you know, 
our mothers are ourselves. But for me, there's, there's two mothers to process, and, and that's uh, had its own interesting, interesting um, challenges. Um, big fan of Carl Jung and the Red Book, which you can go and visit. And it is like a visit. You have to go and visit it in the library, or you did when I was at Falmouth. You have to book a visit, take it out. But you're not allowed to take it out of the library. You just have to go and sit with it in a, on a table. And, uh, yeah, that was a really great experience to have a look through that book. It's really big, and it's um, all of Carl Jung's personal drawings and paintings and diary entries. And these are my notes from when I was on the MA and went to go and look at the Red Book. So just some snaps from my, what did you call them, research journals. Uh, visual influences. I mean, yeah, luscious watercolours by um, early 20th century artist Emil Nolder and other artists from that time, like Sheila. Um, Linda Barry, contemporary comic artist, she's brilliant. She's really interested in emotional authenticity and in process and in waiting for the, the sort of heart of the matter to come to you before you, before you work. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm very much influenced also by mogul miniatures and medieval books of hours. I love the way they structure their narratives in these really intriguing ways and also the jewel lake colours, the detail. They're very much like early comics, I think, in, in many ways. Um, here I've taken a little, stolen an idea really from, from that period where you can see I've split the narrative into little sections within one image. And I got that idea from Radha and Krishna, a uh, Mughal miniature. You can see them in different positions, getting raunchier and raunchier, um, divided by these trees same thing here with a medieval book of hours and my take on that um, it's an image of a kind of blissful re-entry into paradise where I spend the day with my birth mother in a park graphic novels, big influence here's just one of my bookshelves of graphic novels, I've got quite a collection built up, there's a few other random things on there too aren't there, like Buffy and Kate Atkinson but um, yeah, some really really great novels here, I'm a big fan of Brecht Evans uh, you can probably see the influence a bit um, Billy Me and You Nicholas Streeton, she's a um, director of Ladies Do Comics which is a wonderful organisation that everybody should join, it doesn't matter if you're a lady or not Um yeah, I first discovered this art form through my friend Rosie. I was actually about 30 at the time. Well, it was my 30th birthday. But I felt really thrilled by that possibility of being able to combine word and image, which I hadn't really considered since I was a kid and used to copy the Beano. So, yeah, a few thoughts about working autobiographically. Um, what does the term graphic memoir mean to me? How is my work true to life or not? So I've changed the names and a few details about the people who feature in the book in order to protect their identities. Um, some characters look very different. Um, for example, all the helping characters I've made into animals, which was my nod to the way um, animals could represent primal instincts or wisdom in fairy tales. Um, this is my therapist in the form of a horse. I dreamt about a white horse one night and she suggested that perhaps it was a symbol of her. So that's why she's a white horse. Uh, Linda Barry, she, again, she asks, well, is it autobiography if parts of it are not true? Is it fiction if parts of it are? And I love her term, autobiofictionalography. Bit hard to say, but um, much more accurate, I think. So is my graphic memoir truthful? Well, Linda Barry says, memory does not have to be factual. And indeed, it often isn't factual. The borders between fact and fiction are hard to delineate. Um, certainly, how I recall events is different from how my birth mother or my ex-partner would recall them, I expect. Um, but I wouldn't say that I'm lying. I'm just remembering things my way. I don't like to talk about alternative facts, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there are, there are emotional truths, aren't there? And we all experience things from the centre that is us. Um, Jeanette Winterson, she says she gets rather tired of us worrying about what's fiction, what's true. Uh, what matters is what writers do with the experience, whatever the experience is. Whether it took place in my imagination or in my psyche, or whether it took place in my physical body, do we really have to split hairs like that? That's Jeanette Winterson's thoughts. Yeah, I kind of agree with her. And I think that, um, you know, in my novel, some things 
that took place in my imagination or my psyche in my dreams for example were as real as things that took place in the physical universe um for example there's a passionate encounter in chapter eight with a, a man who resembles the god pan and i've sort of merged the myth of pan with the reality um a lot of the eroticism really takes place in my imagination but that doesn't mean it doesn't have a significant impact or indeed that the outer man was a, a hook on which to hang a really powerful inner projection on um but then you know people who are more important to the story specifically my ex-partner david david and my birth mother i have changed details about them and i i have consulted them because i feel like that is important and i want to honor their feelings um so david actually read the draft of this novel straight after my ma i was afraid he would you know be really upset or angry but in fact he was very supportive and he told me that it really helped him to process what had happened between us because by then we'd split up and obviously he had a lot to put up with during the time that i was uh, going through all this with my birth mother uh, he's been a real ally in keeping the faith and carrying on with this book um my birth mother hasn't read the book yet and i do feel nervous about that um i have offered but she's not right now interested and i wasn't really that serious when i was offering i'm glad she said no um she's very much not really wanting to engage with any of the painful stuff i don't think she'll ever want to read it or see it and it doesn't really affect her because nobody who knows her knows me so no one will connect us um i've put here what i've learned from exploring my fear is that part of me is still a child who is afraid of being cut off from love by even mother's anger and disapproval actually but that that fear imprisons me and that's why it's so important to state my emotional truth um including in the pages of this book so the book is for me really about being as authentic and emotionally honest as i can be which feels both scary and liberating so yeah i'm consulting the people closest to the story but i'm not going to change my emotional truth to please them um you know my mother's world both my mother's are ones with a lot of secrecy and emotional suppression um you know the post war generation and in fact my birth mother grew up in northern ireland so she was actually a war generation she says she felt she grew up in a war zone um you know because of that i feel like my generation i'm in my early 40s we've really had to learn how to do emotion differently and not just drink it away or stuff it under the carpet or keep busy i'm not interested in doing that um which you know is a cultural clash with my parents generation um so yeah i think there is a political social cultural impact of doing this as well as it being a personal thing i remember matt said that um he'd like me to mention the difference between art therapy and you know writing a, an emotionally meaningful book which isn't just personal catharticism is that a word catharticism anyway um you know that that so there is the individual level of it but i think it's also quite a sort of cultural quite a deep cultural thing on so many re- levels like you know being a good person very much associated with keeping your feelings down not getting angry um maybe not pursuing what you feel is really important because it might upset somebody and and even the, the sort of low self esteem uh, I'll be men listening to this I don't mean to dismiss your feelings or or your validity of your emotional traumas but the the sort of cultural thing around women just being of less value you know that's very deep um here I'm talking about Pandora's box and uh I I've kind of woven my story into that myth a bit partly because my birth mother actually said to me you've opened Pandora's box now and now all hell will break loose and she really wanted me to kind of put the lid back on that box and I didn't want to so yeah why why was Pandora required to box up and disown something and what was it uh, the ancient greek poet's hesiod's answer doesn't satisfy me now it's because women are responsible for all the evil in the world 
It's a version of the story we're familiar with today, but the Pandora myth predates and outlives him. Good girls don't go digging around in the dirt, unearthing old boxes. Well, that's the story I was given as a child anyway. That and that the perfect adopted daughter should be content to remain unaware of her origins. So yeah, I mean, this thing about digging up secrets and about challenging ideas of what it means to be good or not to ask questions, even though these might be about your own personal stories or the way that you personally were raised, the personal is political and it has so much to say about yeah, the the way we operate as a culture. Uh, a little bit about being good. So yeah, my adopted mother is aware I'm writing this book. Because she doesn't feature much in the story, I don't feel it's necessary to show her the work in progress. She can read it when it's finished if she wants to. I am nervous about her reaction when she does read it, but I've come to realise that any discomfort she may have in accepting me as a separate person, with my own dark thoughts and places that she can't touch or or can't help with, is for her to come to terms with alone. And I don't have to protect her from that my entire life to the point where I suppress my own voice. And actually, I shouldn't. So, creative blocks and challenges along the way. I've had plenty, and sometimes I haven't been able to work on the book for months. It's just felt too emotionally demanding. Uh, During those times, I've tried to focus on more light-hearted painting projects, just sort of watercolour doodling, taking the pressure off, trying to find some pleasure in the work. And I think that actually has been a really useful way of resourcing myself for the times when I feel ready to tackle the book again. And out of that actually has come a completely different book, which, um, sorry, go back actually, a completely different book called Soul Colour, which is coming out with Liminal 11 in April, which is all about working your way through creative blocks and developing a deeper relationship with yourself and your inner process through painting. Yeah, how, how have I kept going? What supported me to keep working on the book? I had some real wilderness years after the MA. It was really tough. There was a lot of personal work, life image, life issues. It was very overwhelming. Um, but, you know, gradually I've built up a support network and found some space and time to do, to do it again. Um, yeah, connecting with other artists. Ladies Do Comics is really great. Really recommend that, whether you're a, a lady or a man or anything else Um, it's open to everybody podcasts um, maybe forming a little peer group after you leave the MA I've got a little group on Skype with two other graphic novelists who are trying to get their first books out Um, one of them is Becky Jones who was also on the MA although not the year that I was there I met her later through Ladies Do Comics Um, inspirational reading um, Julia Cameron Linda Barry it's amazing woman called Pat B. Allen So yeah, lots of books about creative process, blockages, um, all of that stuff's very interesting to me and feels very relevant. Um, And I guess we, we sort of, you know, try to make our jobs what we, what we want to know or learn. So um, my day job is as as an art teacher, that's mainly what I do to earn money. And I've started to really specialise in courses with names like Art for the Afraid, Mindful Art Journaling, Intuitive Watercolour, um, yeah, all the kinds of things which I feel... I want to know more about. It's good to have your own space. Difficult, I know, but if you're able to set up a space in your home, even just a little corner in your bedroom, just somewhere where you can work. Sorry about the squeaking, that's my chair. So, yeah, where do I need to go from here? My novel's pretty much fully storyboarded as a pencil draft, and about 75% of it is completed artwork. Um, Right now it's looking like it's going to be about 200 pages, which is far too long. So I'm going to have to try and cut it down to 160. Um, And hopefully it'll be coming out in about a couple of years. Um, I do have a publisher. We haven't signed the actual contract yet, but they have said a yes. Um, It's still a little bit scary. I've got my hand on the table touching wood. But uh, yeah, hopefully you will find it out there in the world in a couple of years. Um, We talked a bit about why is it important to tell the story, that it's got a cultural, political, as well as emotional, personal dimension. Um, I'm not going to read all that, but if you want to read it, you can. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, there's lots to say about this, really. Um, 
attitudes to motherhood, sentimentalization of it on the one hand, um, sort of quite toxic narratives on the other hand, if you're young, poor and single, um, a very pro-adoption conservative government right now, which doesn't invest in family support centres or ways that might enable women to keep their children, um, an archaic attitude to family planning in Northern Ireland, um, and then, you know, the sort of idealisations around adoption as well, which can put a heavy pressure on the mother-daughter relationship um, for the adopted family too. Healing Fiction, that's a title by James Hillman, but I think it's lovely. Um, so yeah, trying to turn denial and ignorance of suffering, which was definitely where I was at, into self-compassion, self-awareness, um, sort of reoffering my own story. And I do think that will have a ripple effect on people I come into contact with. If you work on yourself, then you will have an effect on the world. If you want to have an effect on the world, you do need to work on yourself. I really do believe that. Um, and I, I used to work in environmental campaigning and I've done a lot of protesty things in my in my time, but I really do feel that changing the world, changing yourself, they're not opposed, they're complementary, as in complete, complementary of an E. They, uh, they complete you, you need to do both, and they form two parts of the whole. Uh, just some thoughts on Trauma Here by Sarah Lightman and Art Spiegelman. And that's it. And I am at 30 minutes, so I need to stop. So yeah, I hope my slideshow has been of some interest and shown you a bit about my process and my project. I've really enjoyed reflecting on my journey with the book with you and sharing some of the artists and writers and people who've influenced me. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you the very best with your own projects. If you'd like to stay in touch, my website is www.emmaburley.com. So send me a message or look me up on social media. Everything you need to know is on the website. Okay, bye.